Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's panel discussion about sports washing. My name is Kerim Zidane. I'm a journalist with The Guardian, covering the intersection of sports and politics. Back early at the beginning of this year, I wrote an article proclaiming 2022 to be sports washing's biggest year. The reason I said that is because the year began with the Beijing Winter Olympic Games and has continued onwards, and we've seen several cases of sports washing from Saudi to multiple other countries, and his book ended at the end with the Qatar World Cup. So, with that, with that in mind, it's important to note that all these countries have been accused of a wide range of human rights abuses and have used sports as an opportunity to promote their regimes, to enhance their regimes, and to distract from human rights abuses. This is essentially the process of sports washing, and that's the objective of today's panel, is to provide some insights and some stories from my esteemed panel, and right now I'd like to introduce them, starting with Malcolm Bidali. Malcolm is the co-founder of the Migrant, Migrant Defense, a Kenya-based civil society organization defending the rights of migrant workers in the Middle East. Bidali is a former migrant worker in Qatar himself, actually, and he was a prominent whistleblower at the time, and he anonymously documented what was going on in Qatar, and then the end of the day was exposed. And when he was exposed, he was arrested and placed in solitary confinement for a month, and then was eventually deported from the country. So, after that, I'd like to introduce Jemmy Hamo, and Jemmy is a... Tibetan human rights activist and a community organizer who's recognized in one of Canada's leading magazines, McLean's, as one of the top, the, <clears throat> the top 50 powers list of 2022. It's a wonderful achievement as it is. I'm based in Canada myself, and that's a hell of an achievement. She's also one of the most prominent youth activists in the No Beijing 2022 global movement, and she was calling for the boycott of the event. Unfortunately, the boycott did not happen, but this is something that we will end up discussing further here. Lise Klovenes, for those of you who are Norwegian or who are based here, really needs no introduction, but for those who do not know who she is, I will give a very brief introduction here. She's a lawyer, a deputy judge, and a former Norwegian national football team player herself. She's also the very first female president of the Norwegian Football Federation, and she's used her position prominently, really, when working with sport, world of sports leaders to bring awareness to the human rights abuses taking place in Qatar. She's done that in recent speeches and has continued to do so. So, can you please give our panelists a warm <laughs> applause? <laughs> so, I'm really excited to really speak to all of you today, and I'm going to start, actually, with you, Jimmy. So, <laughs> yes. So, really, you, one of the things that caught my attention when I was reading about you was this quote that you had. And this quote was that every Tibetan born after 1959 is born an activist. Mm -hmm. Can you please expand on that and tell us a bit more about it and your process of getting into all of this? For sure. Um, for Tibetans who have been displaced not once, not twice, but many times uh, since we lost our freedom in 1959. Um, I believe that the very existence of our people is resistance. Uh, the Chinese government currently is hell-bent on trying to eliminate our identity in every way possible from the way of our lives, uh, the nomadic way of life, the cultural aspect, the religion, even our language, where it's being systemically displaced or replaced by Chinese language. Uh, and so when that is happening back home, um, for us, you know, that's why I say that every Tibetan that is born after 1959, with or without choice, no matter how politically active they are, their mere existence becomes resistance. And that's why I believe that everyone born after 1959 is very impressive quotes, and how does that lead you towards sports activism? Because that's really what we're here for today, and you were part of that global youth movement with regarding the Beijing 2022 Games. Mm -hmm. So how did, that, how did one lead to the other? For sure. I think, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge the privileges that I have being someone that was raised in exile because I don't face the oppression that Tibetans inside of Tibet have to face, where there's no freedom whatsoever. Um, and so given that, 
we've seen in 2008 when Beijing was allowed to host the Summer Beijing Olympics, they made a promise to the whole world that the human rights situation was going to get better. Uh, and that was a fake promise. We all knew, especially Tibetans, we knew what was happening on the grounds. And great um, human rights defenders, specifically like Golo Jamila, who's in our audience today, you know, they were gathering testimonies of Tibetans inside of Tibet, interviewing Tibetans and asking them, you know, what's the impact uh, that this is going to have onto the Tibetans, the local Tibetans during the 2008 Olympics. And even then, the whole community, the international community, did not listen to us. Come 2022, it was again a repeat of that same mistake. China was being uh, awarded this international games, this prestigious games, and what does that do? It's sports washing. You know, what does sports washing do? It has, like Karim already mentioned, it legitimizes the human violations that somebody is doing. It's turning a blind eye. The international community is saying, oh, I see you killing somebody, but I'm just not going to see it, you know? But here's my money. Let me support you in killing that person. But I'm not going to say that there's blood on my hands. But there is blood on our hands in the international community because that's not the first time that has happened. In 2008, that happened. And after 2008, when Tibetans inside of Tibet rose in numbers, Tibet was shut down. How often do you hear about Tibet in the news? You know, prior to, in the 70s, Beastie Boys was having free Tibet concerts and everybody's like, free Tibet. Now, how much of it do you actually hear? Because information inside of Tibet is impossible to come out. I don't have access to my family members that are extended beyond my immediate family that is inside of Tibet. Why is that? You know, and so speaking of that, the 2022 Olympics, when it was awarded in 2015, Tibetans rose up and told the international community to wake up. They didn't listen. 2020, before Thomas Bach had a meeting with his executive team, over 150 uh, human rights groups, activists came together, wrote a letter to him and said, you know, you did this mistake in 2008, let's not repeat it in 2022. But they still went ahead. That's why after repeated attempts of activists and organizers trying to reach out to the international community, International Olympic Committee to either postpone or switch the games, not allow Beijing to host it, allow someone, uh, some other country to host it, they didn't listen. And that's why we called for a boycott Beijing campaign. Um, and earlier you said it didn't happen, but I would like to you know, argue that in many ways we did have many victories because there was over 16 countries that diplomatically boycotted uh, the Beijing Games. And I think that was a result of the work that great activists like Bema Jomala, who's here in this audience, and many other community members you know, worked really hard for because months before then, nobody would have listened to us and said, oh, diplomatic, or even a diplomatic boycott was possible. But because of our organizing, because of the protests that we were able to do in Greece, we had 16 countries at least make the say that they care. Now it's up to us to hold them accountable and to allow them to show us that they care. I actually appreciate you correcting me there and mentioning the diplomatic boycott, because that was going to actually be next, my next point, that there definitely was a form of a boycott that did take place. Would you consider it to have been effective? Did it change anything necessarily? I think it's important to understand the context. You know, why is the Chinese government wanting to hold the international uh, prestigious games of Olympics? They're wanting to host it because they want to seek legitimacy. You know, they want to get legitimized, one, in an international context. They want to be seen as the country that is hosted both, is the first country to host both the summer and winter games. Um, they also want legitimacy inside. Chinese people within China are starting to rise. There are queer Chinese dissidents, there are lawyers, human rights lawyers, there are activists, environmentalists, all Chin of Chinese descent who are rising against the government. And they see that as a threat. And so they need their own people to buy their narrative, saying, no, we're actually making China a great country. Right? And how are we doing that? Because they're able to host these prestigious games. So they're just really trying to host a grand carnival and just do a magic show for the people. Right? And we allow that as an international community to happen. 
right? So with that said, if that is the intention of the Chinese government, when we do diplomatic boycotts, or when we even speak out as an, on an individual level, saying China doesn't deserve to host the Olympics, or right now, you know, China must be held accountable about the Tibetan people inside of Tibet, that hurts them because somebody cares. And those diplomatic boycotts, even if it was just words by governments and athletes still got to play, people got to hear about it. Why is our government, you know, pursuing a diplomatic boycott? Norwegians, Estonians, you know, who may have not even heard about like what's happening inside of Tibet are considering, why did our government boycott a diplomatically boycott the Beijing Games. Well, it's because of their treatment of the Tibetans, their treatment of the Uyghurs, and all of the other things, the long list of human rights violations that China has uh, been committing for decades. And we can really move on to, from China and the human rights abuses that it's committing to Qatar. And Malcolm, I'd like to lead into you next. One of the things that's been spotlighted with, since really since uh, Qatar won the right to, to host the games in 2022 has been the migrant crisis and the labor crisis and the exploitative and abusive labor that's been taking place primarily surrounding the construction of World Cup sites, though we can add anything that's taking place right now in, in Doha from the building of hotels to roads, etc. Can you please explain this a little further, talk to us a bit about it and share some of your experiences when you were in Qatar? Uh, can you please repeat the first question? Well, the, the question <laughs> yeah. really is, since some spotlight, we're, we're talking about the spotlight of human rights abuses and migrant uh, labor crisis that's taking place in Qatar. Can you explain, expand on that, please, for us, and then talk about your experiences as well? Okay, so, first of all, uh, glad to be here. Uh, shout out to Human Rights Foundation for bringing me here. First time in Norway. Uh, okay, so, the migrant situation is not as black and white as many people make it out to be. Uh, most migrants typically start out, you know, trying to get a better life for their family, you know, uh, just to change uh, the living conditions. Uh, they have, you know, school fees for their children, you know, all these things, family support, uh, you know, da da da, all these things. And so that's how it begins. Then you go to the recruitment agency. Uh, the recruitment agency is kind of like, the broker between you mm -hmm. and Qatar, or you know Dubai, or G or the, you know any of the GCC countries. So there, you pay a recruitment fee. Uh, mostly, it is like one thousand, one thousand two hundred dollars, or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. uh, so you basically have to pay to you know go to Qatar and all those things. So when you get there, uh, depending on the company you you get, uh, be it security cleaning, uh, gardening, driving, you know, all those things. Uh, sometimes they might switch up the contract on you. Uh, so you might sign one contract in Kenya because uh, sometimes the HR people come to, to Kenya or Uganda or any of those countries. They come, conduct interviews, and then you sign a contract. But when you get to the country, you might find that they switch the contract on you. So that's one thing. Like, there's a lot of things that happen, like, you know, and I'm just trying to be as brief as possible, yeah, so. Uh, that's one aspect. Uh, even the salary itself, you might agree on a certain salary while in your country, but when you get to the Gulf, you find it may be deducted, you know, by a substantial amount. And there's not really much you can do about it because uh, if you speak up, you know, you're liable to be deported back home or just be, you know, face retribution. Uh, and Another thing about the situation for the migrant workers is just the living conditions, you know, just for, you know, uh, the lived experience I've had. Uh, cramming six, eight, 10, 12 people in one room, uh, that is, you know, uh, insane, and it makes no sense at all. And migrant workers are just supposed to kind of like take this line, you know, down, down. and uh, that was what happened actually with me, because at first I was, I didn't want any trouble, you know, because uh, there are no jobs in my country, or, you know, or if there are jobs, you know, you need to have, like, uh, we call them godfathers, you know, someone in the government or someone who has connections, you know, who can get you that job. So when you get to these countries, you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to ruffle any feathers, so you just keep your head down, uh, do your two years, because it's mostly two-year contracts. Uh, so that 
that was what happened for me. So I kept my head down for as long as I could, but uh, eventually, <laughs> eventually, I, uh, you know, enough was enough, and I decided to speak out on something. And uh, I was lucky enough that I got the support from a couple of civil, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, MigrantStrike.org was the first organization to help me publish my articles. Uh, how I got started doing articles is another long story, but you know, yeah. Uh, so I did articles and blogs and just basically uh, commentary for like about a year or so. And then I did one particular story that got me into trouble. Uh, yeah, I've answered all your questions, right? So far. So far. And, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like to know now is, okay, so you've gotten yourself into trouble. Yeah. You get exposed, and you're arrested by the Qatari Secret Service, or the Security Service. Yeah, State Security. State Security yeah. Service, thank you. Now, guide us through this specific experience, if you're willing to talk about it. How was that experience? How was, you know, dealing with their judicial system, if we can even call it that, the, the okay. prison complex, etc. as well? Okay. Uh, before I answer that, I'll just take you like one step back, just to provide context. Uh, the way I used to write, I didn't write like with my name, like Malcolm mm. and all that. I used to use uh, an anonymous name, not anonymous name, a pseudonym, you know? Uh, I used to be Noah. So I had Noah on Twitter, Instagram, you know, on all these other things and on migrantrights.org. So because obvi of, for obvious reasons, you can't really use your real name, you know? Uh, it's not like you're like, hey, come get me, you know? Uh, so you have to be kind of crafty when doing these things. So that's just, you know, just to, to set the, the, the scene. So I blog and I tweet and I do all these things for about a year and then uh, I do one story about uh, this particular individual, uh, the mother to the emir, you know? You know, I'm assuming this is a free speech, uh, you know, situation. So, you know, I'm going to name names. So yeah, Sheikh Amoza, <laughs> she, happened to visit one of the properties I was working at at the moment. Uh, she's affiliated with that property and most of the royal family as well and most prominent families. Uh, that is Mishereb, downtown Doha. And so one day I saw something, uh, it's actually a very long story, you know, but yeah, I saw something that wasn't supposed to happen, and I wrote about it. Okay. And in Qatar, like you can write about a lot of things, but uh, don't touch the ruling family. Uh, and what do I do? I touch the ruling family, and you know, uh, because I felt I had to. So fast forward, uh, state security, they didn't actually come for me. The, I think they gave the order to my company, and then my company handed me over to the state security. Uh, so I get to state security, the SSB, State Security Bureau. Uh, interrogation was repetitive, uh, boring, uh, both boring and scary at the same time, uh, because this is the first time I'm facing this, because I thought like the most they would do was just deport me, because uh, in Qatar you make any form of trouble, uh, the worst thing they can do to you is deport you without your pay or your benefits. So I was thinking like, okay, uh, uh, deportation, like, well, you know, yeah, I can do that. You're expected to be out yeah. of the country by the next day, basically, yeah, 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 something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, but now I'm in the State Security Bureau, I'm like, okay, uh, no, this is, this is weird, you know? So they ask me, who are you working for? Uh, why are you defaming Qatar? How much are they paying you to do this? Uh, tell us about MigrantRights.org, tell us about Amnesty International, tell us about Human Rights Watch. Tell us about Equidem, Fair Square, all those organizations that I worked with, uh, you know. And it was repetitive, repetitive. They had taken all my phones at the time. Were you given any access to a lawyer, or anything, oh, any of that system at all? <laughs> one, one of the first things they told me was that we are not the, your average police. <laughs> yeah, you, you are, you know, this is a different. You're in a different situation, my friend. So and this is where the world yeah, cup's being held. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they told me, we are not your average police. You don't have rights. I told them, no, I need a lawyer, you know, all these things, all these things. Say, so you don't get to have a lawyer. Your matter will be decided in court and, you know. So we went from interrogation, now they're talking about court and all these things. Before that, they had taken all my phones, 
uh, they had made me give give up my passwords, uh, my credentials, you know, all these things. Uh, I had done some deleting of messages and emails and all that, but I later came to find out that, you know, that was uh, kind of useless because, like, if they want to, like, mine, you know, they can just bring up the data and all that. So, yeah. Judicial system, like I said, I wasn't given a lawyer. Uh, wow. Uh, free speech, right? <laughs> the Kenyan Absolutely. ambassador, the Kenyan ambassador, the then Kenyan ambassador came to see me. I told him that I didn't have a lawyer. They were supposed to provide a lawyer because that's what an embassy is supposed to do. It's supposed to take care of your citizens abroad. They did not do any of that, uh, you know. So when I went to the prosecution, the prosecutor was beginning to cross-examine me or question me, and I was telling him, "Okay, uh, you're the prosecutor, okay." I've watched, enough, I've watched enough movies and series to know that I need a lawyer. And he tells me, okay, did you come with a lawyer? I tell, uh, no, I didn't come with a lawyer. Uh, he asks me, did your ambassador come to see you? I tell him yes. Did you ask him for a lawyer? I say yes. Uh, then since you don't have a lawyer, let's proceed. And we proceed to do all these things. And, uh, you know, I was made to sign a confession in Arabic. Uh, like I said, it's a long story, like all oh, this is a long story, I'm trying to be as brief as possible. So the judicial system is just, but luckily enough, uh, ILO and uh, ITUC stepped in, uh, they provided uh, legal services for me, and uh, I got a lot of support from the Qataris themselves, the citizens. You need to understand that the Qatari government and the Qatari citizens are, are two different things. I think that's a fair point to say generally yeah. about authoritarian regimes yeah. as well. The people are not the governments in charge. And for the most part, people who live, I mean, I'm, I'm from an authoritarian country, well, not Canada, but my original country, Egypt. <laughs> so, I mean, that's for debate, wherever you want. But uh, uh, wherever you're from in an authoritarian country, for the most part, you really don't have, you can't speak out, you, can't, you have no say in what the government does. So this is pretty much what you're talking about yeah. here, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one thing that actually caught me off guard was a letter that was written by students, faculty, staff, you know, uh, you know, alumni from Qatar Foundation. And this was just like students, you understand? Uh, it got like, I think, 240 uh, signatures and all that. And they wrote it to one of the members of the ruling family, uh, demanding that I be given due process. And they actually said that I embody the values of, of Qatar Foundation. And they were even puzzled as to why I was being held, you know, because I was just like telling the truth. And the government was trying to kind of fix the story that I was uh, spreading lies, you know, defaming the country and all that. But in all my writing that I've ever done, they could never prove that anything I said was, uh, you know, not true. Like everything I wrote was true because I've lived it and, you know, I've done all these things. Uh, I've answered your question, right? Yes, you have. Okay. Again, for now, okay. but I'd like to move on to you, Lisa. You are one of the very few football federation heads who has spoken out, really, about Qatar. Why did you choose to use your position for this specific topic? Yeah, it's a complex and a simple answer. You know, uh, I was uh, told to do so by the members of the Norwegian Football Federation. We had a debate in Norway, a boycott debate which ended up with a vote actually at, at mm. Extraordinary Congress where, where the, the grassroots of Norway uh, uh, had a big debate and, 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 and it voted for, for not boycott, but 26 initiatives that we should follow, uh, work towards FIFA, works toward our own system uh, to, to avoid sports, uh, sports washing. And uh, it was also, I don't know what the English word for, you know, a suggestion coming from the bench, you know, that you come a suggestion at the Congress, uh, which were voted on as well, what was that with the president, which was not me then, and I was never planning to be a president either, I was the technical director, sports director, was uh, going to, had to go to the FIFA Congress to criticize FIFA for the award of World Cup to Qatar, and uh, for the conditions now that they hadn't followed up on it good enough, and also on the corruption situation in, in FIFA. Uh, so it was a march order for, for, from the members 
uh, and I also felt that very strongly when you know when things were difficult before holding the speech. It was you know not not easy situation. I was a new president, first Congress, um, a lot of obstructions. I felt very strongly that it was uh, it's a duty, a duty I really appreciated to, to have the honor to do, but uh, but still a duty, and uh, and uh, I would not say it was me. It was you know Norway and the grassroots of Norway. That's a very interesting thing that you say, that it was a grassroots movement. Does that suggest that sports washing is a commonly discussed topic here in Norway? Is it a prevalent uh, topic? Is it something t people take seriously? Yeah, it's, it's been a, a process. We've had a very steep, I would say, from the federation. I, I worked there for some years now, but I spent my life in football, so I've been part of the federation as a national team player, also a critics. I worked as a TV pundit and I saw the federation from the outside, FIFA, UEFA. Now being within, I would say that uh, it has not been a subject for 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 the federation many years ago, and it has been a process, uh, especially when the award was or the World Cup was given to Qatar. You know, in 2010, it was quiet. Some medias, some very few medias, took this topic and wrote about it, but not very many. And then some years after, when you know the debate started to, to arise also in Europe, uh, and um, and and FIFA acknowledged more responsibility for the human rights situation, not just the rain. 2015 going forward, it started, you know, slowly to, to, to increase intensity. But I would say uh, when it really took fire in Norway was after the, the Guardian article in, in 2020, it must have been. Um, uh, and then really, you know, pushed the federation, you know, it was a very difficult situation for the federation. Uh, because uh, we, we, caught, we were caught out, out of guard, uh, if I can say it like that, and because it hadn't been pro uh, a topic at the Congresses, of course it should have, you know, so, you know, but it hadn't, not once. Even though the president and the board had done a lot of things, you know, from 2015, visiting Qatar and so forth, it had never been a debate, it had never been a part of the demo democratic uh, discussion, which it, it of course should. So it was like from, not from zero, but from a level, a bit low level to, you know, extraordinary Congress. So very steep learning curve. Uh, we, did, we did our mistakes in the process as well. Uh, but it ended up with, uh, you know, I would say now that it's, it's uh, something that uh, the Federation and the members are, you know, very agreed upon that we should engage in. And we're also obliged to. We have the 26 initiatives. It's not only the World Cup, it's general. So, which I think is very good, but we're, you know, amateurs in it. It's, it's difficult because the core of what we're responsible for is football development. Uh, and and um, it's difficult to draw red lines because then what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And we have, sports should be played everywhere. Short sports should especially be played in countries which need it. You know mm. what I mean? Uh, but uh, which event, uh, which terms, which, uh, which uh, transparency, which discussion should we have on before and who, who should, how should the uh, transfer of money go? Uh, and all these things is, you know, the, the federations cannot take this discussion alone. Uh, we cannot at every juncture know which turn to take. We're, we're, we're too, too young in this, uh, mm. but we sh of course are responsible to, to dare to be part of it. We're responsible to, to acknowledge the fact that football is very, very, what should I say, vulnerable to, to sports washing because of its, you know, um, global following and extreme popularity. It's very obvious, you know, it, it's a megaphone for good forces and bad forces. So, but, but if, if, if the blacks and whites are too strong, you will scare away all sports people because then every dilemma will be double standards and you have to handle dilemmas all the time. You every, also have to in your work. It's so, true. Every situation so, is different and has to be taken with its own context. You're absolutely right. But you did mention the vulnerability of football to sports washing. And it's true. Sports washing in itself is evolving and is developing. And there's a variety of different ways. Okay, there, you, can go, you can expand beyond hosting the Qatar World Cup and go into the fact that there are various monarchies and authoritarian regimes that are flat out purchasing uh, football teams very prominent Premier League football teams. I mean, there's Man Manchester City, uh, Saudi Arabia just bought uh, Chelsea. Newcastle. Uh, pardon? Newcastle. Newcastle, sorry, Newcastle, yes. Thank you for that, thank you very much, Newcastle. As we're, as we're, 
uh, we're, we're seeing this occur more frequently, and we've even had Saudi Arabia go to individual people. Now you have Leo Messi being a, a tourism ambassador for Saudi Arabia. Do you think football is really going to continuously be prone to this sort of corruption, or is there something that can really be done to, to limit that? You, you mentioned that Norway wasn't interested in a boycott when it came to the World Cup, but what can really be done actively to pursue these other forms of sports washing in football? Yeah, yeah it's, it's of course a very good uh, question with not, you know, one answer. I do think, you know, first of all, we have to go into the scene, you know, to adapt to the dynamic discussion, not you like be like here and we are not in this discussion. And that was, you know, why I was also honored to have the duty to go to the FIFA Congress, because a lot of federation has spoken out towards Qatar award, but not in the bodies, you know, not at congresses, not face to face with people and it was also very difficult it, it, you you're also afraid to be disrespectful it's it's a different country it's a different situation and and it, 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 you should also be humble but 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 it is difficult because you know so many wrongs have occurred uh, so i do first i do think the first step is is to have a attitude discussion you know real to have pressure you know to to pressure you know gets results but, but uh, uh, you cannot fix this problem with only regulations, because then as a lawyer, I must say, regulation has its limits. You will always have like too steep or, you know, too steep um, uh, regulations, then we will try to find something else, which will be just as bad, mm -hmm. but legal. So you have to work, you know, with the whole, you know, diagram of things that it's uh, regulation. Of course, you can try this and that. You had the financial fair play and now they try something else in UEFA. Uh, but that will not get us to the goal. Uh, not, neither will boycott, not boycott, boycott but this, the discussion is, uh, is very rich, I think, and important. So in the end, we need, you know, leaders with, uh, you know, knowledge about the subject, like you tell, you know, you, you tell us and you have done throughout you this year, not knowing it, I guess, because you were a big name for us do, throughout the boycott debate, you know it, Torvald and the guys. We remember, of course, Malcolm very much because it was, you were arrested in our boycott debate. Uh, and so, so to have that, those channels with uh, knowledge, and, and, uh, and I do think it's very important that um, countries also, because I too think it's, it's the demands for championships are so high now, it's easier to have it in authoritarian countries, because then you will have state guarantees like this. It's very difficult to arrange events in countries like Norway, for example, because you cannot give this. this is, these are my speculations, I have to note this, but it's difficult to get the state guarantees because it's not how our country works. So you back out, you know, now we applied for the Euros for Women 2025, and even that, you know, we have, not, not even that, because, but women football has not traditionally gathered so many people as, as it's coming now. Uh, and we realized this is the last event we will be able to hold due to stadium size and stuff like that, but also state guarantees. So I do think it's a very complex situation where, where we, we all have to engage uh, and tackle it together. Uh, you know, have, like we discussed also outside that, of course, we should play football in China as we trade with China. Uh, or maybe we should not trade with China and then we should not play football in China, but football should never, you know, uh, shut down sport uh, so that ki children cannot, you know, be a part of the global movement. But how can we do that so that they don't start, like Qatar, for example, start with, you know, the, they have no women's national team, but they start with the biggest, you know, window for sport in the world. Of course, it's, it's, not, it's not the right process. Uh, uh, now I'm not answering the question, uh, <laughs> Malcolm, but... but I do think for us football leaders, we have to be very clear that we have a responsibility. It's, it's not about football not being politics, because these are, it's, it's our own policy, politics. You know, we're affecting the world, it, it, it's a global movement. And then, and then we need to, to look at regulation, leadership, and, and what's it called, supporter voices, because that will also affect who, who do you elect. And very importantly, people should be aware that you do elect people in the Western country. You, you do, ele it's elections. We have congresses and people should come to congresses. Uh, and we have to make people much more aware that what we call in Norway pump, I don't know what you say it in English. It's, you know, leaders that, you know, just care about money or whatever. If you think that, go and vote then uh, so that you have a dynamics with the people represent your country.
There's an argument that some critics of sports washing make, which is that if, if, if sports do not go to these places, if you don't take global events to these places, places like Qatar, taking events to Saudi Arabia, and you know, the list really goes on with these countries, then there is no opportunity for them to expand on their values and to turn more progressive by just being <coughs> exposed to other cultures and identities. What do you think, Jimmy, about that kind of statement? Um, reflecting on the first question that you even asked about this idea of activism, I think every one of us that is present here, by every move that you make, it's inherently political. You know, there's a saying that if you're not part of the problem, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And similarly, when you're silent, that is also complicity. Your complacency is then adding to the murder that is happening right beside you, even if you ch decide to turn a blind eye. So similarly, when it comes to sports washing, everyone can make arguments, and as both of the, uh, of the esteemed colleagues have mentioned, it's much more complex of an issue. Um, and I think it's important to look at the true intentions and the current situations of the sort of given proposal. For example, speaking to China, because we were avid activists for boycott of Beijing 2022, because there was a track record of human rights violations that has not been happening necessarily in, in a year or two. It's been happening for decades. The Tibetan people have not been home for 63 long years. My parents were born in exile. I have not been able to enter the land and touch the soil of my own country. Um, and we have not been silent. Tibetans have been rising in thousands and numbers in every community you can find across the world talking about the situation inside of Tibet. And when we choose to turn a blind eye to that, it's pretty obvious that the Chinese government is using it uh, to legitimize themselves. And so it's pretty clear when you look at the track record of these governments uh, and how sports are being used as a tool to ultimately gain legitimation or a seal of approval almost to be able to continue what they're doing. Uh, and when we don't speak up, we continue to get, give them an opportunity for more variables to be able to present at a decision-making table. I think, I think what you're saying is extremely valuable because it also reflects on the fact that sports have fan bases and different teams have extremely loyal fan bases and fandom factors in a lot into our discussion because they can be either very useful or mm -hmm. very uh, oppositional. It is a form of tribalism at the end of the day and it has been both a, a weapon and a curse when it comes to activism. As a journalist, I have faced plenty of opposition from particularly the hardcore fans of any, of any institution. Lisa, what do you think the role of fans, football fans in general, have they, do you see them as being more oppositional to these types of uh, you know, ideas of sports washing, etc.? Are they opposing the idea of an authoritarian or do they simply not care? Do they simply say things like, I just want to watch the football? Because that in itself is problematic, that kind of, empathy, uh, that kind of apathy. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and in Norway, where you know, we, we have supporters that really care. They have been you know, carriers of you know, this engagement in Norway, together with you know, clubs and some, some medias. Uh, so, so I do think the solution, we're all part of the solution. You know, if mm -hmm. you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I, and I agree. But the, jun you know, the turn and the junctures are not, you know, it's... It's easy when you see it black and white, but you know it's not, you know. It's, it, Qatar is, you know, pretty, f so it's, it's an easy example that it should not be that. The award should mm -hmm. not have happened. There was no infrastructure, you know, no, no football culture and, and, uh, uh, when, when it was awarded. Uh, but in Norway, you know, the supporter has been, you know, the core of it. And you would say, why would not the leaders go in front? And of course, it's a very relevant question. And we need to ask ourselves that, you know, as leaders. Uh, we should not push players ahead of us, not supporters, but we do need, uh, need uh, the supporters, you know, which are our, I would never use the word customer for a supporter because we don't, but I don't know word, what the word fabruka macht is in English, but it's very important to have uh, the, the, the fans pushing the leaders, showing them, uh, I will not elect you if you don't, you know, do this according to my values, because or else we're a part of a global movement. It's 210 countries. It's a very complex project. Very few of these countries are democratic, and you're supposed to win elections. Uh, uh, Infantino is supposed to do that, UA for president. So 
you know, the dilemma is it's, it's total, you know. So we, we need fans to raise their voice and to voice their concerns. Uh, and then leaders should, of course, react. And it has, in the sports world, not been so. And I'm very curious now why, why that fear, almost, uh, of, 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 you know, having a dynamic debate. Uh, and I, I'm new to this. I'm, I'm humble. I try to learn. I also feel it myself now. It's, it's, I, I have very many people telling me about dip, dip, uh, diplomacy, you know, that this is not the way it was a good speech. But remember, you know, it's, it's, you have the centimeters when in the quiet way. And of course, I know it's also true, but I also know that pragmatism is, is very important, but sometimes you also need to lift the debate out, out loud or else you will never have, you know, um, a, a way in for your voices because then we will like guard. But I do think it's, it's very important that the supporters care more because regulation cannot do it alone, players cannot do it alone, leaders cannot do it alone. And we would not, I think, be in this position in Norway without the supporters and, and that, uh, that the supporters are now cheering for values aside with their team. If Thank I may that. add, I think, Please do. you know, one, first and foremost, money talks. That's why it <laughs> happens. Simple as that, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think it's very important to acknowledge, um, you know, the dangers of that. When we continue to stay silent as an international community, you're setting precedents. You're continuing to allow it to happen. And when that happens for generations and generations, we create this historical amnesia. People forget the stories of what is happening to the people on the grounds that is being affected. And when that happens, there is a deep danger that all of us will stop caring. What is to be human without caring? You know? It's very powerful. And that unfortunately ends our main time for this. I believe, Lisa, you have to leave at six o'clock. It is now unfortunately yeah, yeah. six o'clock. I told them that I need to be really uh, unpolite and just go because I meet clubs at the digital meeting. And no, I understand. However, if we do have time by any chance, uh, you're welcome. You're yeah, welcome to leave you whenever so you're ready. Here, so Please, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. you. That was right. wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. However, if we do have a couple of minutes and there's members in the audience who do want to ask questions and you're willing to answer a couple of questions, by all means. Yep. Yes, right there. Hi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Speak up, by all means, yeah. 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 Of course. As I said earlier, Tibet was completely shut down. How often do you hear about Tibet in the news? You know, Tibet is a media black hole. Sending information out of Tibet by phone or WeChat is more dangerous for them than, you know, engaging in protest. Uh, I'll talk about this tomorrow, but there's, you know, Yishi Chodron comes to my mind. Yishi Chodron is a medical doctor who protested the 2008 Olympics, and she's still not home. We still don't know about her whereabouts. Thousands of political prisoners are have been detained, have been gone missing, their families are missing. That's because of the international world that you know, stayed quiet during the 2008 Olympics. There is a grid system, a Orwellian state a grid system inside of Tibet where everyone is getting tracked. There's face recognition technology. You know. um, there's also Lhamo who actually died in prison for sending money to her family members outside of Tibet. That was her crime. She was detained and then tortured and beat to a point where she passed away. Completely, and we said that earlier, right? It's like 2008 was your testing ground. If you really thought that China was gonna change, and China actually made promises. They said, I'll make a deal with you. I will make it better inside of Tibet and inside of all of these areas. And they didn't follow up. They lied to your faces and yet you still choose to give your money to them. Why? What's wrong with us? <laughs> You know, and if I may just respond to earlier Human Rights Watch, you know, let's make human rights sexy. Let's do it. Let's make it attractive, <laughs> right? How about having um, a football tournament that becomes at the world stage celebrated for human rights champions? <laughs> you know, 
why does only authoritarian state? We've created the precedence for only authoritarian, at one point Lisa even said, right? It's almost easier to host these large scale football tournaments for authoritarian states because they don't have to go through the bureaucracy. So then, why not? Let's create our own version of having fun. I'm sure regular citizens like you and I who care about human rights also enjoy a nice game of football or soccer, or a basketball, whatever it is that they want to watch without feeling like there's blood on their hands for watching a game and cheering for their favorite team. Political. <laughs> well, for us, as a Tibetan, the Chinese government is our Taliban, and it's happening right now. So if it's, it can happen to us, it can happen to you, right? And when Absolutely. I keep saying the people, it is... The people are what makes the government. And in that sense, we hold the government accountable. And even, yeah. and even if and even if the government itself, like Qatar, could tell you, well, all LGBTQ plus people are going to be perfectly safe in Qatar, are you going to believe them? Is that something? Can you take, based on what the Look stories Malcolm has told us today, based on the story he's told us, can you actually take what they say at face value anymore? Or ever, in the first place? Pardon? Uh, for, of course, you have to always factor in that they, they will never allow no, nationals. Foreign, not, non -Muslim. There you go. Muslim, yeah. And my name is Mm -hmm. I must operate and have the right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, goodbye. Yeah, and even go. that, I don't think, you know, is actually any reason to talk about it because look at Peng Shui, how yeah. she was completely silenced. Absolutely. And we're talking about these IOCs, we're talking about the safety of athletes. That's what they told us when we were asking for them to boycott the games. They said, oh, we're scared about the athletes, athletes shouldn't speak out, you know, there's danger in their lives, okay? Why are we sending our teams there? Last question up there. Democracy. Well, I mean, they operate almost as a mafia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Malcolm? I, yeah. you want to add no, 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 I can only speak about FIFA. FIFA in Qatar like, has been a disgrace. Uh, yeah, it's been a disgrace. Like, it's about six months, I think, to the World Cup, and people are still not getting paid. People are still living in, yeah, people don't get paid. Uh, people delay. Uh, we've had strikes. They've, we've got uh, journalists covered a lot of strikes in Qatar, people, have, people are demanding their salaries and all that. Uh, sometimes they choose to delay your salary, so you can work in January, but you get your salary in March. And that time, maybe, let's say, you've borrowed money to pay the recruitment agent, and the money you've borrowed, you've borrowed it from an informal institution, so the interest is, you know, way higher. So every time they delay the payment, the interest goes up, so you're caught in a loop. So that is if they decide to delay. So if they decide not to pay, you understand, so, you know, your family back home is the one who will pay. So that's one thing. So non-payment, uh, they don't even look into, for example, uh, the living conditions of uh, the migrant workers. Uh, if a foreign journalist or an envoy of that thing uh, comes to visit Qatar, they will take them to a model uh, <laughs> accommodation. Like, look, they have a gym, they have this, they have this, they have good food. But no, like, bring them to the other side. They'll, you, know, uh, you know, there should be like some proper tours of, of, of the, you know, uh, accommodations there. Uh, migrant workers themselves don't even have the privilege of a normal life, you know. Uh, it's like they're... I don't know, like like aliens, you know, alienated from the rest of the the thing. So my point is just about like FIFA. It has been such a big disgrace. Uh, where's the camera? FIFA. Yeah. Do better. <laughs> um, if I may just add to your question, I think what can we do about these independent organizations? If they're independent, I mean, all of these entities that are so-called independent, um, why do they host games? Money talks. And then it goes back to the same question, right? Who gives them the money? In many ways, and, and it's not easy to just throw the responsibility on us, but if every single one of us who went to watch the football game is there chanting free Tibet, they can't <laughs> shut down the uh, live game, can they? Right? And if it wasn't just 
uh, the activists, the Tibetan and Uyghur and Hong Konger activists in Beijing Games or the Olympic torch ceremony making that call for boycott Beijing. And if it was all of us calling for that, would the game still continue? No, not necessarily. And so I think there's a way for mass mobilization to happen to hold these independent entities accountable. If no one is attending the football games, doesn't matter if it's LeBron James, mass football games not happening. You know, their contracts of millions of dollars is cut because they're not bringing in the viewers. And who are the viewers? It's us. And then we have so much power to be able to hold not just our government accountable, but also media. And for mm -hmm. us, you know, when we were organizing about the Beijing Olympics, NBC lost millions of dollars because they had actually the least amount of viewers. And so earlier we talked about diplomatic boycotts, but I didn't get to tell you about all of these other victories we got. Absolutely. You know, in terms of the viewership in Canada where I'm from, more than 50% of Canadians actually voted for a full boycott rather than a diplomatic boycott. Why is that? That is true. Because people are starting to care. They want, they know that their money talks and they're willing to put it where it matters. And they're willing to walk the walk instead of just talking about human rights. That's a great point to remember, yeah. absolutely. Thank you so much to both our panelists here. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, folks. That's it.